And I'm so happy to welcome Katori Hall to Q. How are you? I'm good. I'm making it. How you be? I'm okay. You know, I'm like yourself, I'm sort of in the middle of this pandemic and pretending I'm not. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's 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 outside. It's everywhere. It is everywhere. Well, it's one thing for me to be talking to people in the middle of the pandemic. You're you're launching your debut TV show. In the middle of it. It's not like you're going to the store to get Skittles. How are you, you know, not going to the store to get chips. How are you, um, how are you doing releasing this TV show? Well, it's been really crazy. So we've been doing press junkets from my bedroom. And so there is a part of it that's actually probably easier, you know, than jumping on a plane and, and flying to this place and that place. But I obviously miss being able to sit amongst people and, and be with an audience and watch them watch the show. That was one of the things I was really hoping for. But, you know, the, what happened is, is what's happening. Um, and, you know, there's there's the, the pandemic, but there's also, you know, intense social change that's happening. And so um, there's there's a there's a lot to 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 work on and, and work through. And I'm just really grateful that I have I have my breath and, and you know, I, I call it my my little my little distraction. <laughs> <laughs> This TV show launch. Yeah, it's just a little distraction working on a TV show. That's all it is. Um, I should say P-Valley is based on your play that premiered in 2015, Pussy Valley. And in researching that play, you interviewed more than 40 women across the American South, visited the strip clubs where they dance. In doing those visits, in doing those interviews, what struck you the most? Their humanity. Just how similar they were to me, right? I remember going into the clubs and I was, a, I was a little scared. I was like, are these women really going to talk to me about their lives? Are they really going to let me in? And I think because instead of throwing dollars at them, I was throwing questions. Mm. They were like real open, real quick. They're like, oh, this is a human being who in, instead of they're, they're not objectifying me, they're, they're seeing me for, for a real flesh and blood human being who has um, dreams and aspirations and, 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 and knows and understands that a choice was made to be uh, on this stage. And so I cultivated these relationships quite quickly with numerous women. In fact, um, one of my favorite moments was that I celebrated my 30th uh, birthday in the women's locker room. Uh, popping bottles with the dancers at, at Sin City. We weren't, it wasn't the stage. It was like, we were literally backstage, you know, and it was just them talking about their kids and, and, and talking about uh, why they, why they got into the business. And so it, for me to be a witness and to observe and, and be a witness to their actual lives beyond the walls of the strip club, it was an amazing gift. And it was a gift that I wanted to give to, audiences because we know that the world of stripping has been stigmatized we know that these women are dehumanized even the images that we do see of, of dancers in media you know we're just seeing their bodies we don't ever get to go home with them mm. and so i really wanted people to understand that they are they are wives mm. they are daughters they are sisters they're your cousin and they are all worthy of respect like you know, i just feel like every person really deserves their story to be told. And so I was just really honored that they let me in and, and were so honest and transparent with me because they knew that my deep desire was to humanize them. And I, I, I don't I'm I don't mean to be superficial here and I'm 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 taking great caution not to be. But one thing that st stood out to me in watching the show is the strength that it the physical strength that it takes to actually work the pole to and i from what i understand you you that's tried it superficial. that's not superficial that's everything there's a way there's a way that i could have said it that would have sounded superficial is what i'm trying to say it it, it you tried it right and it's, it's i tried it i yeah. tried it it's like in memphis uh when you try something and you fail we go you tried it and i tried it and i failed over and over and over again um i went to a pole fitness class because Pole dancing has become very mainstream, which I find very interesting. And <laughs> I remember taking that class and I tried to climb myself up on that pole and I slid down. I was on a spinner pole and I remember going round and round and round and I got nauseated and I had to run out of the class because I was going to throw up. And in that moment, I was like, I got so much more respect. Like I already <laughs> respected the women, 
But when I was, I, I saw how hard it is and, and how much skill is required to do it. I was like, oh, oh no, we, we need to show the world that this is a world-class sport. As a matter of fact, I started going to uh, pole dancing championships and, and following the women. There's uh, many, many women that are online who are our world champions. Um, Alethea Austin is one of my favorite pole dancers and she actually ended up being one of our dance doubles for, for Gidget. Mm -hmm. She actually won, um, I think Miss Sexy, I forgot which year, uh, but the New York Pole Dancing Championship. Like this is a sport. It is an art form. And I think when people watch how we were able to capture that, um, they're going to respect what these women do. It's like exotic dancing is not just about taking off your clothes. Yes, there's an element of striptease and even an element of burlesque to yeah. the world, but the the net the other side is the the pole tricks these complicated moves that require like you were saying this strength this flexibility mm -hmm. like there are women who can do a, an entire split on the pole they are defying gravity mm -hmm. and I want people to understand and respect them for the sheroes that they are yeah there's a, there's a moment in um in the David, the premiere episode where you cut out all of the music from the club and you just hear the uh, like the breathing right. and the pole the squeak of the pole and the clattering of the feet and you and you and you realize that I want to give people an idea of what this show sounds like so let, let's take a listen to this this is Mercedes, who's a longtime dancer, has reluctantly taken a newbie, Autumn, under her wing at the Pink, the strip club where they work. So, I got a customer want you and me in VIP. You down? VIP? That's not what Uncle Clifford said. The way you getting down up in Twerk Town, you got to come up off of these training wheels. Size, I got to be willing to pay two stacks. A G for me and a G for you. A G, huh? Girl, that's double what you're throwing down nowadays, the champagne room. Besides, you need to learn how to handle VIP. And who better learn from than an OG like me? That is a clip from the show P Valley. My guest today is award winning playwright and TV showrunner Katori Hall. Tell me about the dynamic between those two women and, and maybe Woo! what inspired it. Mercedes is something else. So, Mercedes is the headliner of the club. Like, people come from all over the South to see her on her Mercedes Sundays night. And and she like she puts forth this Cirque du Soleil esque type show, um, and it, w the 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 athleticism is is put on full display whenever Mercedes takes the pole. And so you got Autumn Knight rolling through. She's this new girl. She has this secret, this haunting secret, and um, this very dark past that she's running from. But obviously, you know, she feels like a, a direct competitor to Mercedes, but. Um, Uncle Clifford, the, the gender fluid momager of the club, demands that <laughs> Mercedes, you know, kind of train her up and, and teach her the ropes. And so what starts off, as I would say, you know, it's, it's a pretty antagonistic relationship, um, particularly because it's like, you know, she's there's there's some jealousy there. There's some issues of colorism that are explored because Autumn Night is, is lighter skinned. Mm -hmm. And as we know, Women in the strip clubs who are lighter skinned tend to make more money just because they adhere to a more Eurocentric ideal of beauty. Mm -hmm. So there's just like all these levels where it's like, I don't know about this girl. Mercedes is always giving her the side eye. <laughs> but I think eventually over time, these two women learn that they have way more in common than they thought. And the hope is, is that, you know, um, audiences will root for this burgeoning relationship between the two. But I would say Mercedes gives Autumn Night hell. Yeah, and gives her a hard time. Yeah, in terms of that clip that uh, you just played, you know, there's this guy who wants to give them all this money. And, and so uh, Mercedes is trying to figure out a way to kind of cut uh, out of the deal. Like she's a hustler. She's she's a she's a businesswoman. I, I want to talk a little bit about how this story is told. You said that your new show, P-Valley, pulses with the female gaze. It's an all-female creative team. Every episode of your show is directed uh, by a woman of color. How does that how did that shape the storytelling in the show? It was everything. That was the bullseye to have a strip club show that centered the female gaze. It could have easily gone very, very wrong. It could have been about, you know, dudes rolling up in the strip club. It, it could have just had women 
you know, objectified constantly. But we talked a lot about how we were going to honor the authenticity of the club by, you know, adhering to, to the nudity requirements, but um, making sure that it would never feel gratuitous, that it would always feel in service to the story and in service to the characters. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, all, we experience this entire world through their eyes, mm. through their perspective. And with the directors, we talked a lot about something as simple as camera placement and POV shots. Um, you, When we were walking through the club for the first time with Autumn, we're literally, you know, the camera is literally her or the camera is pushed up so close on her face that you're seeing her reaction of awe and you're seeing her take in this world. And so you, as an audience member, you're like, you're in her high heeled shoes walking through the club because of the way that we are um, thinking about the, the camera. Um, we also made sure that when it came to the nudity, we embraced this idea of shadows. So we know that there's a ton of hypersexualized images of, of black women out there. Mm -hmm. And so in a way to kind of, you know, push up against that history, we made sure that um, the, the women uh, never were kind of fully exposed. Um, we actually, we always call it, this is the visual tease. Like you have to, as an audience member, work to complete the picture. And so oftentimes we'll use like slices of shadow and, and slices of light so that the, the women can move in and out of. So it doesn't, so it doesn't feel so, um, their nudity doesn't feel so overexposed. And so it was techniques like that, that really, um, I think, it funnels the story through the women's perspective. Their bodies kind of fall away and we 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 kind of um, see their hearts more than their skin. I, I want to play another clip. This one, not for, from your show, uh, but from something else you've done. Take a listen to this. Uh oh <laughs> If you're just tuning in, my name is Tom Power. My guest today is award-winning playwright and TV showrunner Katoria Hall. Her new show, Pea Valley, exploring the lives of a group of women who work as dancers in a strip club in Mississippi. But why am I playing you this song? So, Never Too Much was... Luther Vandross. Luther Vandross, yes. Mm -hmm. Luther Vandross by the incomparable Luther Vandross. Luther! Um, it was a song that was sung in a play called The Hot Wing King that was just done recently in New York. Unfortunately, it closed early mm. due to the, the current pandemic. Um, but it centers on a Black gay couple down in Memphis, Tennessee. And it's really about how they are uh, struggling to define uh, their family because uh, one of the, the men is, has just recently come out. And so um, we see them, you know, in love and they're, they're working together to win this uh, hot wing <laughs> competition that happens every year in Memphis. And so their, their friends come over to, to help um, Cordell, who is the, the, the hot wing king and um, the one who has just recently come out right. uh, uh, in, in, in his bid to be become the, the crown or to take the crown of that year's. Uh, annual festival. And so in in the middle of the play, they end up singing uh, Never Too Much. Their their group is called the New Wing Order. And so it's kind of like, you know, it, it feels like an R&B group, but it's not because it's about hot wings. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I've heard you say it was a gift to mm. the, the Black audience members. Absolutely. So we grew up on Luther. I mean, it's it's rare that you you talk to a black person who don't know Luther. I, I'm I'm sure one exists. I am sure. I am sure. <laughs> but uh, if you grew up down south and if your folks migrated from from that place, you know Luther with his that timber and and those lyrics that were always about love. It's just something that that you know, like you you hear Luther at the barbecues and at family reunions, and so. I love to put pieces of Black culture that um, you, you, that are just you know very specific to 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 us as as a community. And so when we play the or rather when they sing the song in the show, they sing it from top to bottom. Uh -huh. like they, 
everything, everything, even all of the riffs. And what we noticed was that all the black audience members knew the words to the song. And most of the white audience members were like, what is happening? Like, do you know that song? Do all the black people know Lucy? Like that was <laughs> a question that popped up. And um, it's it's a gift in, in theater because unfortunately, particularly in New York, audiences tend to be predominantly white. And so when there is a show about black life or, or black joy um, that's done, oftentimes, you know, your black actors are not performing for the audience that is knowledgeable about the work. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, for those who do find their way to the play in, in theater, it, it's just that gift, like you are home, you are welcome here. This is what we do at the barbecues. This is what we play at the family reunion, and this is your church now. I I want to I want to talk to you about that in a second, but before we get to it, I want to talk about another one of your plays. I want to talk about the mountaintop. It's about mm -hmm. the last night before Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated at the Lorraine Motel in in Memphis, and um, I, I was wondering if you could tell us the story of your family's connection yeah. to that. Yes, absolutely. So this is a story that I grew up hearing all the time. So my mother lived around the corner from the Lorraine Motel. Mm -hmm. And she was 15 years old. And, you know, obviously at that time, there were a lot of marches that uh, King was spearhead, spearheading at that time. And um, the sanitation worker strike was one of the most important ones and unfortunately one of the last ones. My mother actually tried to participate in one of the marches, but it descended into um, chaos. And actually a, a friend of hers got killed, um, this young man named Larry Payne. And so everyone knew that when King came to town, things was going to get a little crunk, you know, riots and, 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 and maybe more murder. Right. And so when he came to head that sanitation worker strike and he uh, went to Mason Temple and he did that amazing speech, I've been to the mountaintop. My mother asked her mother, could she go and, and hear Dr. King speak? Because she had never heard him speak before. And my grandmother was just like, you better sit your tail down. You know, somebody is out to get that man. Like everyone knew in the community that someone was out to get him. So my mother heeded her mother's demand and did not go and hear him say those words. I've been to the mountaintop. And as we know, the next day he was killed at the Lorraine Motel. And so my mother's deepest regret became the seed that was planted very deeply in me. And like I said, she watered it every year around uh, during Black History Month. Like, I, you know, I almost heard Dr. King speak before he was assassinated. And um, when I was around, how old was I? Oh, I want to say it's 26 years old. I, it was, it was like we were kind of, coming upon the 40th year commemoration of, of Dr. King's uh, assassination. And I wanted to write a play that really looked at how far we had come or rather <laughs> how far we have not come. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because it was around the time that this guy named Obama was thinking about <laughs> running <laughs> for president. It was just this very interesting a moment in time. And, and so I wrote this play that explored that last night, that night that my my mother uh, did not get a chance to, to be a part of, like right after he gave that, uh, that, that, that speech, that famous speech, he came to the Lorraine Motel and he was working on another speech. And so the play is uh, him dealing with his mortality and, and the fact that he knows that he's coming upon the last moments of his life. But the, the interesting twist is that there's this maid that comes in and he battles with her mm. over politics, um, over all things that concern the black community. And I named that character after my mother because I really wanted to give her a gift because I knew that she hadn't ever been in the room with him. She didn't get a chance to be at Mason Temple that night. And so it was my way to put my mother did she, in that place. Did she, did she get to see it? So she saw it and she did not know that I had named the character after her. And when she saw it, she screamed. And then the people <laughs> in the audience were like, why is this black woman screaming in the middle of the <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, how how meaningful that must not maybe scream aside, how meaningful that must have been for you to be able to give her that. It was very big. And it was interesting because I feel like my parents were just like, why does she want to be a playwright? She ain't gonna make no money. Like, why is she doing this? And that was a moment when my mother was like, This is what you're supposed to be doing. And she wrote this letter before she flew back from uh, London, because that's where the play premiered actually. And she hadn't left the country before until that moment. And uh, she scribbled this this letter uh, of support, uh, you know, right before she left and I framed it. It was like, you know, it was on the, it was like on the back of her orbits printout. <laughs> but it's, it, it was very important to me because it was that moment where she was like, she gave me her blessing when it came to, you know, me, me being a writer. I, I don't know if you, but early when I was introducing you, I mentioned that, um, you know, art can be a great tool for empathy in some mm-hmm. in some hands, and it can also be a great tool tool for social change. And, and you know, and I think that's that's something that we're thinking a lot and sort of debating a lot these days. You know, when it comes to affecting social change, when it comes to rooting out white supremacy and, and racism, yeah. what power do stories have? I think stories they don't change policy. I'll say that. However, I do think that stories can change the policy makers. They mm. can create this moment of understanding, like, like the fact that, particularly with theater, there are communities who have never, you know, there are people who have never been in a room with a black person. There are people who have never been in a room with an Asian person. That, like that's, that's just a, a, a unfortunate fact. But when you put people in the same space and there's a story of humanity uh, being told in front of your eyes, you can de- you cannot deny that group of people of their humanity. You are seeing it with your own eyes. You are witnessing their breath. You are witnessing them falling in love. You are witnessing their struggle. And so that's why I feel like story is so important, you know, no matter the space, no matter the medium, whether it is the theater, which demands you be in the room with the story or, or TV and film, because with TV and film, at least it becomes a theater of one where you are bringing people that you wouldn't have necessarily been in the same room with into your own living room, into your bedroom, wherever your, your iPad is, wherever. But there's this, this moment where the world kind of falls away and this fictional person is being used to tell the truth. And I just really feel as though you have to operate on all in all lanes. Like not everybody can be a politician. Not everybody can be a business maker. Like we all got to do what what we we were made to do. And I feel as though those of us who are storytellers, it's our responsibility to continue to continue crafting these these tales that are are full of love and nuance and create that empathy for groups of people who have been dehumanized for so long. It's quite frankly why I do what I do. Well, so let's talk about that to close things off in the context of, of P Valley, because, you know, uh, we talked about at the beginning, you know, even when I said, how are you? He said, you know, we're sort of living through this pandemic, but also through a great moment of social change and a movement against racism and, and police brutality sweeping the world right now. And as you mentioned, you, you know, stories may not be able to affect policy, but they can change the policy makers. You know, is there something you hope your audience understands better after watching P Valley? I want them to see these women as the the most amazing beings that they are. I was able to be in the room with them and and meet fathers and and meet family members and meet their hearts. And I just feel as though these women, they've been pushed to the margins, they've been dehumanized, but it's time for them to take their rightful place, uh, you know, center stage. Their lives are important. They can teach us a lot about dismantling patriarchy because they're constantly subjugated by it. And so I just want people to to honor who they are and and recognize themselves in in these women and and understand that their story is just as worthy of being told as anyone's story. It is a a remarkable show. Um, I I was pretty gripped to it from beginning to end. And uh, I'll say I feel... Perhaps the same way about talking to you. So it's 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 lovely it's lovely to talk to you. Thanks so much for your time. It was lovely to talk to you too. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it.